This is my Mrs. Jean. I'm John McDonough. This is my son James. That's my son Martin. This is my son Jurit. This is my son Michael. That's my daughter Kathleen. That's my son Patsy. This is my daughter Baby Jean. That's my grandchild Brian. And that's my grandchild Martina. <laughs> You'd believe everything that you've seen, but there's only one thing that let you know that it was a film. When I drove into the play, when we went into the place first, I looked around. I said, "Oh God," says I, 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 I'm not going to stay here because I'm embarrassed with the other Tamilian people. I, I thought the war Tamilian people, the way they were dressed and taken apart, like. But then when I seen the cameras, I knew it was a setup. Is it true, true view? Yeah. <coughs> It might show half the world how we're living in a way and how we're treated. Just a roof above our heads, sir. For the winter, that's Aye. common, sir. And how many children do you have? Oh. About 15, sir. Aye, uh, about 15, sir. Uh, roughly. You mean you don't know how many children you have? Oh, uh, I'd have to count them, sir. Children, children! children. Yeah. Show yourself a nice man. little boy who runs away with his big, huge brother. I'm playing Tito. He's a traveller. And he's the older brother in the story, and he's just looking after his brother when they go across the country. We were travellers once, Tin and Oak. We used to make things out of tin for people. That's why they called us tinkers. We were like gypsies. Why are you talking to the horse? Why not? I'm playing a traveller woman. Um, um, four kids, no man. Maybe he'll change. I can't see it. Mary Riley died in his arms, giving birth to his child. Don't understand. I play the part of Tracker, who is uh, head of the encampment. And uh, I'm very much a traditionalist in, in the traveler's ways. And that's the reason that I have this sort of um, confrontation with Gabriel Bourne, who plays Papa, because he has left the uh, encampment after his wife has died and uh, he, he breaks with tradition in that he takes social welfare money and that and I don't hold with that. So when the kid's horse is taken away from them, uh, he sets off looking for them and he comes to me looking for help and I won't help him. I'm playing Grandpa, who is um, Gabriel's father-in-law. Um, the old guy who's devoted to the sort of the, the old way of life for the travellers, you know, the, the barrel caravan and the open road. You know. I play Barler. He's Papa's pal. And he uh, he goes in the house, try to find the, the kids with, with, with Papa. He's obviously a very old like friend of his. Jesus, it's you! It's me, Barla. Oh, oh. I knew you'd be back! <laughs> Miramax first got involved in Into the West when Gabriel Byrne came down to our office, which is located at the Tribeca Film Center. And we were having lunch downstairs and talking about a variety of different things. And he told my brother and myself this wonderful story about two brothers who steal a horse, I mean, you know, and begin an epic chase across Ireland. And as a result of that, I mean, you know, we just thought the idea of two brothers and larceny was perfect for two brothers to finance. So um, that's truly how the story was a good tale told at a bar. I remember Jim Sheridan on top of a table in a toy restaurant in New York on 8th Avenue saying, I have this idea about a horse, a horse in a high rise. And um, <clears throat> it's just gone from... Um, from that seed of an idea to this, and uh, I, I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. Hold on for a minute, lads. I'm looking. I'm looking for a friend of mine. I'm looking. Remind me of someone. Do you know that? How are you, track? I need your help. Don't you get it from the welfare man? We got along without you, Papa. I need you to track me, kids. Friends of yours. 
Top O'Reilly is back. Bad luck isn't far behind. Tracker! When I start writing her, I did have Cabrian in mind, yeah. You write it and you think, who could play this? And, you know, the only person that ever came to my mind was Gabriel, actually. It's just kind of simply a horse, a white magical apparition appears and leads everybody on a journey. And what that horse is, is up to the audience at the end to work out, you know? It could be anything. An emissary from another world, I suppose, you know? The first time I heard this story was a friend of mine had seen a horse on the balcony in uh, Ballymun, and um, we decided to make a film. After various adventures, setbacks, cul-de-sacs, and all the rest of it, we're finally shooting now, which is good. The location has been completely destroyed. We walk on at half past eight this morning, and the location is 100% different the last time we saw it. So, mwah, ciao. It gets big sometimes when the shot needs it. You, you use the size you need to get the job done. So coming back and through the water and across the top of the dam is speed with you looking back the whole time. Okay. Well, looking back a lot of the time, glancing back a lot of the time. Okay. Good luck, old friend. Bye. <laughs> He calls us his lambs, and he calls um, other people his old things that are his, uh, my darling. <laughs> he can do it. Um, Gabriel, my old thing, move to the left. Can you ask him to do a uh, Ellen, my gorgeous, <laughs> move to the right. <laughs> and that's all. What I want him to do is to appear to lay a false trail very quickly, so that he's stamping and, and turning in his own length and kind of cavorting, um, you know, like a horse does at the start of a race, he doesn't want to go into the, into the stall. Yes. It's that kind of stuff, right? metal spoon to a plastic spoon but it is a low budget film I don't want to complain too much but you know I have to draw the line somewhere this is a, a small budget movie and uh, part of the reason that we got in here was you know if we helped out with the pardons everybody sees everybody warts and all it's such an intimate uh, set up all day every day you know when you see people really down and really worn out and really tired and you can't hide anything. Oh, God. Whoops. <laughs> no, it's some American money from a company called Miramax and a uh, company based in London run by the man in the Mac who's called Guy East, which is a company called Majestic. Mm -hmm. And uh, Channel 4 are also involved, and British Screen, and some Irish investors, and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, We got the minimum amount of money possible to make the film, which is all you ever end up doing uh, as a producer. And it's, you know, it's not tiny. It's not a tiny, tiny budget film, but neither is it a big American studio picture. I don't believe it is that hard to make films. If you've got a good project, I think, I think um, actually it's not that difficult to raise the money. The real problem is there aren't enough good projects. So a script like this, which we think is very, very good, um, was, we felt, certain to attract some great actors, which it has done. It's the cowboy. I thought it was the Indians. <laughs> There's a funny smell. There's uh, three large cards and chips. You're going to serve them, Rico? No trouble. No trouble. we no trouble for most of them. One of them's a squaw, lads. Cross our palm with silver tongue. <laughs> Here you can see a, a, what you might call an Irish film is financed by Englishmen and Americans, uh, 
it's got a, you know, an American cast, an Irish cast, and that's the way, that's the, way the, the film business is. We're making films for the world. Cinema is an international language, and I think every time you say the word Irish film industry or English film industry, um, you are impo you're imposing limitations and parameters on something that should be free and universal. Europe is dogged with the fact that the television world has always funded the films. And the television world, the money comes from people who believe they're living in a kind of Kafkaesque nightmare in which the boss is always going to stop them doing what they really want to do. So they're always going to fund films in which the main character comes up against a situation which he can't really win. Whereas America is based on, let's fund something where the guy wins so as we're all millionaires, you know? It's not a very imaginative business. And movie studios don't traditionally have the first idea, in my opinion. If, th if, if it is proven to them that something works, then they embrace it. Now then, let's start again. Will you answer me honestly? Do you know where your boys are? I don't know where they are, sir. I don't know. Well, don't worry, your white horse is easily spotted. Take a statement and let him go. I think uh, films, uh, international films, are using more and more Irish actors because, uh, well, for a number of reasons. First of all, the, the subject matter is much more purely Irish. In other words, the filmmaker wants to be much more honest to the script. And if it is about Ireland, then, you know, you should, for sincerity, use uh, genuine professional um, Irish actors. There was a time when uh, uh, Irish actors were very easily compartmentalized into, into that little, little pigeonhole. That's all you did. And uh, I, I want, from my own point of view, I just wanted to be known as, a, as an actor rather than as an Irish actor. Not that I was ashamed of being Irish, but in many ways it was a disadvantage because people only assumed you could play little Dublin Elphilus, which, uh, which of course I can do, but there were other things I can do as well. So. I suppose part of it was our own fault. There was a sort of, for long years, the, the, the national inferiority complex about everything Irish. We had it in everything, I think, and that's, that's gone, I think, at last. I think that's dead and buried, like, forever. It is a shame that an Irish actress wasn't given the break and allowed to play the role. Of course, there was this one enormous hitch, which was that they felt the girl um, should be someone who was more of a name than an unknown. But once it came down to it and that that decision had been made and there was no other choice, um, I'm sure they all just felt, well, you know, why not her? I mean, I was here. They didn't have to pay for my airplane ticket. I play O'Mara, who was the, uh, the good policeman the friendly policeman. I get up very early in the morning <laughs> and I turn up on the set. There isn't a great deal of preparation required. He's, he's, just, a very, he's just a very nice man, so it's, uh, I play it off my own personality. <laughs> um, so it's, it isn't physical. It isn't kind of reaching no. in and whatnot. No. Okay. But no. on the first take, you said something like... like no, I, you know, I mean, I've, I've got, st we've got business to, 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 please don't. I'm awfully sorry, this is a very tense time. Please don't. Rather exciting, eh? <laughs> Rather exciting. <laughs> Rather exciting. <laughs> I was just thinking how like Malibu it all is. My character is called um, Noel Hartnett, and he runs a he has a, a stud farm in they say County Meath, and a uh, self-made man who has acquired this horse at a police auction. Um, it's and um, lies that he's uh, actually bred it himself. I don't care what the regulations are. Take the helicopter up. I'm 
Sorry, sir. The airport authority says no. They're estimating two hours before the storm breaks. We don't have two hours. Those travelers have the devil on their side. I think he's a bit of a villain, but I'm trying to see some good in him, you know, because I think there's good in everybody, you know. And I think he's a good entrepreneur, and he probably will have uh, realized the error of his ways and will be really good after all this. I think it'll be a salutary lesson and a chastening experience for him. Pardon the pun, chasing. Right, I'm ready. Have to go. Bye. <laughs> the character I'm playing is Inspector Bulger, who is a very interesting type of policeman who is in league with the horsey set. So that's what I'm doing. I go chasing Papa Riley around Ireland, trying to do him in, basically. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Dancing like an animal, and your children out on the road without a mother to look after them. Well, I'll take them off your hands for good and all when I catch them. Give them a proper home. I think I'm a good policeman myself. Um, but I've been told, no, I'm not a good policeman, in fact. I'm a bit of a rotter. The guy in the cap is a disaster. Lose him. The film industry generates a great deal of money uh, in terms of the VAT on uh, cinema tickets. I think it's in the region of 25 million uh, cinema tickets are sold every year, so that's a great deal of money going back into the Exchequer as well. But none of it is... Uh, going back into film production. I think the total amount of money spent given towards film development and film production in Ireland is £100,000 a year by the Arts Council. And that's, that's usually split between about 12 projects. And I'd like to see anyone make a feature film in Ireland for £100,000. I think when the elements are as strong as they are out there, you really don't have to work as hard. Because it kind of the sea does it for you and the wind does it for you and the cold does it for you. And seeing poor Kieran soaking wet, it, you know, it's, it's much easier, really, in a way. And I think for the actors, it, for me anyway, it's much easier when the circumstances are so extreme, if you just kind of let them carry you along, you just get there much quicker and with a lot less work on your part. The film industry that depended on very set things like sunshine, money, uh, they're the two main things, light and money, you know. And you didn't really have them in Ireland, so you didn't have, so the cameras couldn't keep up with the light changes, you know. I mean, it's that simple. And, and, and England never had a film industry because of that. And then in the 60s, it had some success. and everybody start calling it the British film industry, but there actually wasn't. When you say the word industry, that, that implies that there's an infrastructure there to back up the industry. There isn't really an industry in Ireland. There are small independent films being made by individuals against sometimes overwhelming odds. But uh, four or five films over a space of two years does not make an industry. We have writers, actors, uh, directors here, but I happen to think that um, what we really need here are really creative um, producers. Without a doubt we have some of the most talented people here and in actual fact what's happening is we're losing them to uh, America and England and all over the world. I mean you've the Neil Jordans, Jim Sheridans, you, we've great script writers, we've, we've good actors, we've We've got everything here and no one does nothing about it. The government have got to put money into it. I mean, you just look at Canada and Australia and, and they're selling movies all over the world and they're getting their money back. Why can't someone have a little bit of, uh, uh, be a little bit far seeing and realize that it's an industry, that you can make money out of it? I think government help is what you really need. I think you need some kind of an infrastructure. You used to have it here in the form of a film board that got disbanded, I think, wrongly. 
Um, I think that uh, unless you have that kind of thing going on and some kind of framework within which people can um, you know, communicate with each other, you're not going to have the kind of skills and talents being developed because otherwise it's just too much of a gap from you know, the guy sitting there thinking, God, I'd really like to make a movie, uh, to um, trying to put together a two or three million pound picture. Guys, just open yourselves up for the moment, okay? Remember what we were talking about. Okay, Gabriel? Yeah, open yourselves up for the moment. Here we go. And roll, please. Here we go. And action. The papa wants to let his wife's soul go free or something. Something like that. It's an old tradition of the travellers that when someone dies, they burn the caravan, and then the soul will be at rest. That's the idea of it. Okay, so here we go, guys. I quite seriously don't know. If I knew now what I know then, I don't think I'd have found it. We get seven hours shooting light a day with uh, two children, a myriad of horses, major American stars, appalling weather. It's no bigger than any other film. Um, I think that there were once plans to, to, to do it smaller, but given what was on paper, I don't see quite how they could ever have worked. What's on paper is very specific and very difficult and very precise, and it has to be achieved. And within 36 hours, a kid had fallen off the horse and broken his arm, and we were stopped in our tracks. This is a tiny budget for what's being done, and uh, so everybody is at the last squeak of their energy and their resources and their invention. And it's, it's very wearing and it's very frightening, which is why I get so angry with you sometimes. Piss off! Sorry, I always get like this when it rains. And the weather is just ghastly. We're all in the business of getting it done. It'll get done. They always do. <laughs> They've just come from, from Catman, do you want this is unbelievable, Chris. Yeah. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, yesterday we had to abandon abandon the location because it was like a horrendous rainstorm, and and there was the danger that all the vehicles would be washed into the uh, into the sea. And now today it's snow. I mean, it really is incredible. It looks like we've transferred to like a totally different location, and yet this is the same look. I mean, look at down there. It looks like a fertile wooded green lush valley and up here it's uh, it is like the hindu kush you write a modern story in a play form about dublin it's going to be compared to O'Casey. if you write a novel it's going to be compared to joyce if you write something else it's compared to yates and i mean they've all done it under huge pressure you know at the you know a certain historical time and there was huge pressure on things and they expressed it in such a great way that it's really difficult to imagine it being done better. So even like somebody who's not so good at film could do it, and because it's not been done before, it could look great, you know? I would like to see films that I think reflect what's really going on here. In the way that literature, for example, say the short story writers of the 50s, say like O'Connor or Nafuelan and you know, Mary Lavin and all those people, reflected the real Ireland. What are you doing here? I come here every year on our anniversary. Where's this horse leading me? 
Why is he bringing me back to all the old places? My God, it's not doing you any harm. Is it a good horse? Or is it bad? People here don't have those... They just eat... Because they didn't have money in a funny way, they've no preconceptions of how to get the money and how to be manipulative and make a little film. You know, everybody's trying to make the great Hollywood blockbuster without any of the resources. You know, and that's good and bad. There are 310 million people living in Europe, which is bigger than the population of the United States. So I'm hoping that the, that the cinema becomes truly a European cinema and that Ireland can be at the vanguard of, of that situation. And that's going to, you know, I mean, uh, and the fact that uh, European movies, even more, and I say this as an American, if, if you, the European audience, appreciates your own films and spend more time giving them more press than you would an American movie, you know, more, you know, I mean, time on TV stations, you know, protect your own movies because in America we do a damn good job of, you know, I mean, protecting our American films. You rarely see movies from different countries in America. I mean, they're usually sent to little art house ghettos and things like that. So if you, if you be protectionist about your movie, you'll create a European cinema, and Ireland will become part of that. Ultimately, I think, you know, Hollywood will have the last word. I mean, they're the ultimate users, and you're lucky to get as much out of them as you can. But to beat them at their game, God, I'll never work again, will I? Money and time. That's it just money and time. There's never enough time, there's never enough money. These are 24 carat gold rings and um, some of the producers came to me and said look if you just sold one of these rings we could finish this film but I I didn't want to give them away. <laughs> I am a real policeman. I don't believe you. What's your name? Brendan. What are you doing here on the set? Who with me? I'm on for arrest. I'm down here giving sex as we go over forties. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's money for old Jan. Absolutely money for nothing. I could do I could do this for the rest of my life. <laughs>